In part one, we talked about the history of deciphering hieroglyphs, from medieval Arabic efforts to the Rosetta Stone. We saw the early progress made with the recognition of cartouches as signifying names, the work of several figures in deciphering the Egyptian Demotic script on the Rosetta Stone, and how Thomas Young applied previous theories and work on Demotic to translate the name of Ptolemaeus written in hieroglyphs. However, when we left off, research had hit a wall when it came to hieroglyphs, with the popular consensus being that hieroglyphs were only used phonetically for foreign names. Moving on, we'll talk about how this perception was broken down, and the translation of hieroglyphs became possible once again for the first time in over 1400 years. But first, we need some backstory on the man who made this possible. Jean-Francois Champollion was born in the small town of Figeac, France, in 1790. Neither of his parents were particularly attentive, so he was primarily raised by his brother. Jacques-Joseph, 12 years Jean-Francois' senior, was his first and longest supporter, supporting him through his entire education. He sent the younger Champollion to a well-regarded school in 1802. It was there that the boy began demonstrating the talent which would set him apart for the rest of his life a prodigious skill with language. Champollion first began studying Greek and Latin, before shifting his area of attention to the Semitic languages, studying Arabic, Syriac, Hebrew, Chaldean, and what my sources only describe as Ethiopic. Ethiopic is actually a category including a whole bunch of Semitic languages from Ethiopia, so I'm not sure what specific language they're talking about, but yeah. Anyway, it was also around this time Champollion took up an interest in the subject which would bring him the most fame, ancient Egypt. His interest started with Egyptian culture, which he studied through Greek and Roman sources, but the language was probably on his mind from pretty early on. Champollion grew up surrounded by Orientalist influences from his brother and his brother's friends, and as hieroglyphs were just starting to be cracked by Europeans during his childhood, Champollion was likely hearing about translation efforts from a young age. According to one possibly apocryphal account, at age 11, Champollion had been invited to see a collection of Egyptian artifacts owned by Jean-Baptiste Joseph Fourier, who had been part of the expedition which had uncovered the Rosetta Stone. According to this story, upon seeing the hieroglyphs and hearing that they were undeciphered, the boy declared his intention to read them someday. From 1804 to 1806, Champollion studied at a school in Grenoble, where, though frustrated by a strict curriculum which limited his ability to study languages, Champollion began his study of the Egyptian language of Coptic. As mentioned in the previous video, Coptic is exclusively used as a liturgical language within the native Egyptian church, and no doubt stood out to Champollion due to its differences from the Semitic and Indo-European languages he'd studied up to that point. Champollion's fascination with ancient Egypt had been fully cemented by this point, and he said in an 1806 letter, I want to make a profound and continuous study of this ancient nation. The enthusiasm brought me by the study of their monuments, their power and knowledge filling me with admiration. All of this will grow further as I acquire new notions. Of all the people that I prefer, I shall say that none is as important to my heart as the Egyptians. Champollion found Grenoble unable to provide the specialized education in ancient linguistics he was looking for, and in 1807 he moved to Paris to study at the Collège de France and École des Langues Orientales. He continued his studies of the various languages he'd taken an interest in up until that point, mastering his Arabic during this time, and being noted as the best student in his class. He also studied Persian under one Monsieur de Sassy, the same Monsieur de Sassy who'd taken part in the first French efforts to translate the Rosetta Stone, as we talked about in part one. It was while in Paris Champollion first began looking into the stone himself, as well as reading earlier works on it, verifying some of Ackerblad's earlier works on Demotic, and finding Coptic equivalents to 15 Demotic signs from the stone. Speaking of Coptic, Champollion found this to be his greatest linguistic passion. During the French campaign in Egypt from 1798 to 1801, many native Egyptian Copts worked with the French. After the withdrawal of the French, Many of these French allies faced political violence and chose to flee to France. Among these was a Coptic priest named Johanna Shiftishi, who had served as an interpreter and adjudicator for tax collections under the French, as well as a colonel in the Coptic Legion. Champollion, who had had little contact with native Coptic speakers before that point, befriended Father Johanna, 
who taught him Coptic names and how to pronounce Coptic letters. The young Champollion hypothesized that Coptic had to be related to the language spoken by the ancient Egyptians, and thus assumed Coptic would be the key to cracking hieroglyphs. In 1809, he wrote, I'm totally immersed in Coptic. I want to know Egyptian as well as I know French, because my great work on the Egyptian papyrus will be based on this language. My Coptic is moving along, and I find in it the greatest joy, because you have to think, to speak the language of my dear Amenhotep, Set, Ramesses, Tutmos, is no small thing. As for Coptic, I do nothing else. I dream in Coptic. I do nothing but that. I dream only in Coptic, in Egyptian. I am so Coptic that for fun I translate into Coptic everything that comes into my head. I speak Coptic all alone to myself, since no one else can understand me. This is the real way for me to put my pure Egyptian into my head. In my view, Coptic is the most perfect, most rational language known. From 1809, Champollion began a project which he'd continue for the next 12 years, hypothesizing that ancient Egypt's three scripts of hieroglyphic, hieratic, and demotic were all variations of the same script. Champollion began comparing every document in each of these scripts which he could find, including demotic and hieroglyphic text on the Rosetta Stone, various versions of the Book of the Dead, every papyrus he could find, and whatever finds from Egypt he saw published in magazines. By 1821, he had concluded from extensive comparisons of characters that hieratic was a simplified form of hieroglyphs, developed as a shorthand. His comparative method allowed him to match symbols to their equivalents, first between hieroglyphic and hieratic writings, and then between demotic and hieratic ones. With this method, Champollion was able to compose a table of 300 signs, and would later verify this table's accuracy upon finding that he could accurately translate the demotic spelling of Ptolemaeus into the hieroglyphic one shown on the Rosetta Stone, using only his chart. Yet, he still could not understand the symbols. Champollion was still unsure of how they were even used, though at this point he still believed them to be primarily ideographic, just as most Europeans did. He thought it necessary to find specific evidence of this through direct analysis. Thus, Champollion set out on his next comparative study, turning back to the Rosetta Stone. He reasoned that, if each cluster of hieroglyphic symbols represented a single concept, the number of symbol clusters in the hieroglyphic portion would roughly match the number of words in the Greek one. Counting each out, however, he found that the Greek portion contained only 486 words, while the hieroglyphic portion, even with its large missing section, contained over 1400. Next, Champollion counted out the individual components of each cluster of symbols, coming to 166. Realizing that this would be too high of a number for an alphabet, Champollion found himself puzzled by the script's nature for some time. For the time being, he would continue to hold the common perception that the script was largely ideographic, and used phonetically only in cases of foreign names. His research didn't halt, however, as there was still plenty of work to do on that subject. Champollion's next task would be to figure out the sound values for the signs he'd so far analyzed, and he turned to cartouches of foreign names to do this. As discussed in the previous video, Thomas Young had already attempted to do this with the name of Ptolemaeus, working off of the widely held belief that foreign names were written phonetically. However, Young had had little means of confirming his proposed sound values, as the only other foreign name on the Rosetta Stone had few sounds in common with the name of Ptolemaeus. Champollion, therefore, went looking for a name outside of the Rosetta Stone. He would ultimately use two sources for his comparisons. The first was the Cassati Papyrus, a demotic text containing cartouches with the name of Cleopatra. Champollion found a number of common symbols between the demotic spellings of Cleopatra and Ptolemaeus, matching up with the relative positions of the common sounds in each word. Next, he got a chance to confirm these equivalencies in hieroglyphs, when he acquired an illustration of what was then called the Banks Obelisk, and is now called the Philae Obelisk. Here, once again, he found matching symbols in the places of most common sounds. The standout exception was the symbols representing T in each word, with Ptolemaeus containing a semicircle, while Cleopatra contained an open hand. But Champollion chalked this up to homophones, identifying both symbols as representing the sound T. With this research, Champollion could officially translate a number of the symbols into sounds, most of them slightly different from the values previously inferred by Thomas Young. The sounds he'd found would soon come in handy, 
and bring Champollion to a conclusion which would revolutionize the European understanding of hieroglyphs. Later in the same year of 1822, an antiquarian associate of Champollion sent back some drawings from an expedition to Egypt. These drawings depicted a temple in the Nubian village of Abu Simbel, most prominently marked by massive statues of a then unidentified pharaoh. More importantly for Champollion, however, this pharaoh was labeled, with prominent cartouches displaying his name. Though the majority of the symbols represented sound Champollion did not know, he recognized a pair of symbols at the end as matching the one used for S in Ptolemaeus. Examining the nearby symbols, Champollion noted that one resembled the sun, and speculated that it might be pronounced with the Coptic word for the sun, Re. Sandwiched between these identifiable symbols, however, was one Champollion did not know. He took to guessing, possibly going off of its double arc shape to speculate that it might be an M, and possibly thinking of the Coptic word Mise, meaning child when he realized what name he'd just translated. Ramesses, one of the most famous pre-Ptolemaic pharaohs. And if Ramesses' name was written phonetically, what other Egyptian words might be translatable? Next time, we'll talk about how Champollion confirmed his new hypothesis, and where he went from there. Thank you so much for watching part two, and subscribe for more on decoding hieroglyphs.